I want to get right to some questions here. Uh, love this one. Uh, somebody wrote in and said this morning, hello, and thanks for all that you do. I'm a faithful listener of the show. Any tips for bus safety for my 12 year old student that is very aggressive getting on the bus and riding safely. I have heard reports that transportation is bribing him with gum. And when he doesn't comply, he gets threatened by a security officer. We've already tried a token board. He has had a long history of aggressive behavior on buses. And thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I would, you know, this is not, this is, again, like many other things, we try to just put our kids in situations that are hard for them and, and sometimes we really need to teach them some skills in order to, to kind of manage those things and we can't do it on the fly. Like it requires a little bit of work. So in this particular case being safety, safety is a major issue obviously and I'd like to think that they're, in, I just want to avoid the word bribing and maybe say they're reinforcing him with gum. Um, but I would, two things you can do right off the bat, or three things. Okay, so, you know, from, you always think in terms of what can I do as an antecedent modification, what can I do as a consequence modification, and what can I do to just assist or model the behavior. So I'd say as an antecedent modification, you could actually practice um, if you can off hours, if you have the time, and if you can uh, perhaps find a empty bus, maybe on at school, they can actually put this as one of his goals. They should. It's part of the what he needs in order to access academics. So the school should probably just have it as an IEP goal for him, so that they can practice just go entering the bus, sitting on the bus, calmly and quietly. Now, reinforcers, if he likes gum, great, that's a good reinforcer, that's a perfect reinforcer for the bus, and if he likes other reinforcers, they should offer those to him. Um, during the course of the uh, trip, and I don't know how long the trip is, sometimes our kids are expected to sit on bus or transportation for an hour, over an hour, and they lose it, which I don't blame them, but I mean, and if you knew how long it is, you could shape that behavior up, but regardless, I would suggest you try to give him things that make him busy. So for instance, get him some headphones, teach him how to use the headphones. Uh, perhaps uh, the bus driver can hold for him or you can have in his, iPad, in his uh, backpack some sort of music device, like something that holds music, like an MP3 player. Yeah. Um, or you could even, these days it's so easy to just have a eye touch or something and he could watch a video. I would very much uh, suggest that you give him something that will entertain him to the point where he doesn't even know how time passed um, because you know if you don't have resources and most of the time we just need our kids to do things fast and we can't spend the time to teach them um, then I think that's the best way to handle it because otherwise you could teach it to him but it would be a shaping procedure and it would require some therapy and all that. So much of what I learn in the hour that we spend together every week is about perspective taking. Mm -hmm. Because what you just reminded me is that we do, we put kids on buses all the time. Mm -hmm. And I don't know the last time that any of the viewers have been on a school bus with a bunch of kids. It's a really difficult environment. It's a nightmare. It is a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. The and sounds, I mean, I think one of the reasons our kids lose it is just the noise level. Yeah. The noise level, I can't handle it for more than a second. Yeah, I don't, I honestly don't know how bus drivers do yeah. it. And they, and they have our, our all of our kids' safety and, and they're supposed to be watching the road. And they've got all of those kids. A lot of times they still don't have seat belts in them. So kids are getting up and doing things. It's a lot to watch for them. Yep. But, uh, uh, you know, I can only imagine they're not particularly comfortable seats. And as you mentioned, sometimes for our kids, because they're having to be bused to a specific school, it's not unusual for it to be more than 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. And if you stuck me on a bus every day for mm -hmm. 40 minutes with nothing to entertain me, I would be climbing the walls yeah, too. Yeah, I'd lose my mind. Exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, anything, and I just suggested music or a video, yeah. but I mean, anything that can occupy the, the child, you, lots of little games, you know, that you can buy. Um, at, at a uh, CBS or something, they have all these little travel games. You yeah. know, those, uh, anything that interests him, you have to help him um, engage himself in something because yeah. it's just difficult. It's very difficult. And 
figure out what's cause. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm saying all this without even knowing what the behaviors are, what happens. Absolutely. Like, I assume I'm just making assumptions that he's maybe getting out of his seat. He's maybe tantruming, throwing. I don't know. But I mean, there's a reason for it. And most likely it's because he's uh, just uh, disturbed by everything yeah. that's going on and bored. And, and, and this is a, an issue, though, that it, we see a lot in the autism community. And when we hear about it, it's usually after something bad has happened. Yeah. Like yeah. the child has gotten aggressive and somebody else complained. And so now the child doesn't have busing to go to school. Right. Or, and that's... That's like the least of the the scenarios we've we've seen in the last year the um, the nine year old who uh, got aggressive on the bus and the police got called and police at gunpoint with a nine year old Ugh. because a nine year old was aggressive on a bus like a nine year old uh, would even understand what right. a gun is like the, the bus driver who was being abusive to an individual with a disability um, uh, and it was filmed by another student with a disability on the bus to say this is it you know things are happening on buses and and part of it is that we need to educate the people who are driving the buses but we need to give them tools too Absolutely. and part of that you know it sounds like as as horrifying as it may sound to this parent someone is trying yeah. uh, we're calling it bribery but somebody is trying to find a way to make it worthwhile for the child to sit there absolutely and i mean i think you should actually assist with that and the way that you do that is, for instance, you can set a timer and the timer, you know, you could give a tic tac after every five minutes and yeah. then you gradually increase that to 10 minutes and 15, 20. And therefore your child actually learns that if I sit quietly on the bus for the duration of the ride, I'm going to get some delicious uh, uh, motivating dessert or yeah. something or gum or whatever it might be. But, um, you know, don't look at it in terms of a negative thing. I'm glad they're actually trying to give him something positive to reward him for sitting. Um, I don't like the fact that they threaten him. I mean, first no, of all, kids okay. have no idea what threats mean. Um, they probably just get really scared of the loudness of the threat and so on. But as I said, most of the time, if you're able to occupy your child with something or give him something that he can occupy himself with, it's not only good for... Uh, the bus ride is just good in general yeah. because our kids need ways to entertain themselves. Yeah, but uh, but I'm wondering at this point there needs to be a specific intervention and and since there is somebody in transportation that is using the gum maybe that's the person that they can go to and say hey let's work together Possibly let's, right. let's work yeah. together but let's let's say exactly what it is i i would encourage you to get it written into the an iep yeah, as part absolutely. of your behavior intervention plan so that it becomes legal you don't want to have a situation where people decide to take it in their own hands and go well this is how i'm going to handle it right and right. with no training exactly um uh, really, uh, really incredible that we all make sure that our kids are safe while they're being transported. Right. Oh, my goodness. Uh, okay, another question that just got written in this morning. Do you have any information about good clothing for extremely sensitive children on the sensory side of things? Daughter cannot stand tight or even feel of inner seams. Clothing is off in a fight to the point that leaving the house is difficult and she is six, six years old. Uh, we, we see this a lot, Yeah, so right? she has a lot of sensory issues. So, I mean, I don't know of any specific brands. Cotton on, I assume. Anything that's cotton and loose, I assume, would probably be the... I mean, it sounds like the issue is, is looseness, so you should probably get a couple of sizes too big all the time so that she doesn't really feel the seams. Mm -hmm. But um, having said that, I think it's something that you should probably try to work on. Which again, it's it's just getting the child used to it, which is a reverse shaping, backward chaining um, okay. process. So it's kind of like, you know, you will perhaps put the, um, you know, a belt mm -hmm. on so loose that the child can't feel it, and then very very gra and reinforce that, and then very gradually tighten it a little bit more and more and more and more until the child can feel it. And as you, each increment you reinforce. Okay. And you could do that with anything. You could do that with sleeves, with, you know, you could just put a loose, um, you know, those belts, uh, what are they called for the back? The ones that oh, Velcro, yes, yeah. something that is loose initially uh -huh. and that the child can tolerate and then you gradually teach the child to actually make it tighter. Um, I would work on that because it is something that's gonna affect your child sure. on an ongoing basis. Yeah. So. 
It's difficult. Yeah, there are many companies that specialize in that kind of clothing, and all you have to do is put in and say sensory clothing, and you'll get a wide variety of things. There are places that um, knit things in a circle mm -hmm. so that there is no seam mm -hmm. uh, while you're working That's on it. But I think it's uh, and they do things that are tagless. Sometimes even the tagless stuff, Tag? that, yeah, because they'll put um, uh, it'll be slightly raised print. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that can bother our kids, but um, but take a look and see and I would suggest asking for a sample when you uh, write off to the company so because a lot of times they're expensive but you know what this is a actually a very important point I think if, if your child is like has that level of sensitivity yeah. especially if it's like you know you go to the point where you even have something tagless and it still bothers the child yeah. then you can you should just imagine what your child's going through in general you know, in, in terms of a sensory world. Yeah. And so you would need to remember that pretty much in anything your child does going forward, whether it's lights or sounds or anything tactile of any nature whatsoever, crowds and so on, and always keep that in mind. And also that's another reason why you'd really want to teach your child to over, try to overcome that. Yeah. And, you know, sensory issues are absolutely trainable. I mean, we can definitely increase uh, tolerance to certain uh, tactile stimuli just by practicing them. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, pro you know, that's the longer term fix, I think. Absolutely. Really important to know that that is something that you can work it's on. It's tough, yeah. Really incredible. Okay, our next question. My son is seven years old on the spectrum. He cries at school when he needs a break and wants to play outside in the playground or spend time in the sensory room rather than work on academics. He goes to a public school in an autism ESE classroom. He cries at home too and frequently requests the iPad. Normally, we and the school uh, use a first then statement and he will continue working. On bad days, the tantrum would last between 25 and 30 minutes at a time, two or three times a day. What can we do to extinguish this behavior? Love all the specifics that yeah. they sent. Yeah, and, and the good language. jargon. <laughs> <laughs> we love that. ADA is becoming such a part of our world. It's it amazing. Is. So let me get all the facts correct. Okay. I think he um, he will at school. This happens where um, he will scream or he cries. He cries, and then I assume also in school they'll say, you know, if you finish this, then you can have that. Yes, yeah, the right? first then statement. Yes. And so what you're trying to do is eliminate the crying because. He is waiting, right? right? So they're trying to do is eliminate the crying. But I th she's saying on bad days, He'll just that cry. It, will, it will go to a tantrum and it will last between 25 to 30 minutes. Right. Well, And that could be two to three times in a day. Right. So, you know, this is one of those situ situations where you almost have complete control of the situation, but there's a little bit, like you just have to clean up the process, okay. the procedure a little that bit. That sounds hopeful. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, this is a child who's already learned that, uh, you know, when I, I think what he's learned, and this okay. is one of the situations where it would be very important, I think, to get a behavior analyst to do a good functional assessment. Okay. But what it seems like is that he's learned a sequence, which is when I get upset, I cry, um, and then they tell me this if-then statement, and then a few minutes after that I get my reinforcer, which is time, free time, or to right. stop and go play. Right. So he hasn't quite learned that he could potentially get that without crying, right? Ah. So you really want to teach him to get a break without crying first. So what you would do is you'd time that you you know you'd look at the time frame that he's usually able to wait. So in other words, when the, let's assume the crying starts at uh, an hour in, like he's in the classroom for an hour, and that's when he starts to cry because he really wants a break. So at about 45 minutes, you just prompt him. You just go up and say, "What do you want?" And you can visually prompt him, you can verbally prompt him, you can tell him, essentially model for him what you want him to say, which is, I'd like to go outside um, and play. And so you'll now start to teach him to request going outside on its own, just as a pure behavior, without preceding it with a crying bout. Okay, so now he's learned to use his language instead of crying. Right. Okay, so that's great. Days when 
he's, you know, first of all, you'll empower him more so that he'll have fewer days now this is where he's in a bad mood. It is very, very important that when our kids learn to ask for something, um, either, so one of two things has to happen when he's learned to ask for going out. Uh, going for a break has to be always available to him so that when he asks for it, he's allowed to go. And if it's not always available to him, then he has to have a visual understanding of how long before he can go. So the if-then statement tends to become a little meaningless. I mean, I know that the child will probably understand, okay, when they say this if-then thing, mm -hmm. that means I just have to keep going and then I'll ask again, I'll ask again, I'll ask again, and they'll finally let me go. And that's not really what you want. What you want is everything to be on a time frame. So I would suggest that you, if he asks, if he says, can I go out? Either you can let him out, and that's great, or if you can't let him go out at that moment, you set a visual timer for him that says you'll go out when this goes, when this buzzes. So that it's no longer something he has to keep asking for. It's just very clear. When the thing buzzes, you're going to go out. Do we do that? Like if he should, let's say he he says, okay, I want to go out. You say in 10 minutes, you can go out. But if right. in that 10 minutes, he starts to cry, right. do we still let him go out? So what you do is, first thing is, that when you first teach him, I want to go out and you're trying to teach him without crying, you know, right. so at the 45 minute mark or whatever it is right. before he gets frustrated. So when he first says that for, for let's say a week, every time he says that you let him out okay. because we want that to become a very fluent response. Like right. we want him to know, can I go out, get some a break? Yeah. Okay. Now we got to teach him waiting. So the first thing you do is he says, can I go out? And you set the timer at 30 seconds. Okay. So we're not and starting. Then you let him out. Okay. Then the next time you set it at one minute, and then you go out. Then you keep it at one minute until he's really good at that. Then two minutes. Then three minutes. And then ultimately you build it up to a point where it uh, makes sense with his schedule. You always shape things because if you don't shape things like that, if you don't gradually increase them, our kids don't really. I mean, they just don't know how long they have to wait. Time right. doesn't make any sense to them. This is one of the biggest biggest issues we have with our kids is that they don't when you say later or tomorrow or after a minute or just a second none of it it all means the same thing it all means not now that's all it means <laughs> right and, and not now is not something easy to tolerate you know i always use this example when they tell you like you're tired you go to work and you know that you're going to get off at 5 p.m. Yeah. Okay. So that actually helps you tolerate the whole day. Right. And especially when it gets closer, you start to get better and more excited and so on and so forth. Now, imagine if you went to work and you never knew when you're going to be done. Yeah. You never knew if it's going to be 2, 5, or it could be even 10 o'clock at night. Right. You just have to be there until someone says you can go. Yeah. So there's a very little aspect of control. And so our kids need to have a way of knowing. So one of the things I try to teach our kids right from the get-go is I, I'll start with, like if they have an iPod or an iPad or something, I'll put a timer on for the whole duration of time, like they're supposed to do something and have it count down. Okay. And so that they can see, you know, every 10 minutes they're going to get something. Okay. That is going to change their lives so much. If you set 10-minute time, 15-minute timers, in 15 minutes you can go wash your face. In 15 minutes you can get a piece of gum. In 15 minutes you can go outside. And if you just break it down for them, they'll never have a behavior problem. Okay. And I think, you know, I hear that and I go, oh, that's so powerful and that's so wonderful. But we have to make the commitment to do all of the steps. Absolutely. You can't cheat it. You can't cut corners on it. You can't Absolutely. suddenly go from 30 seconds to Absolutely. 10 minutes. Right. You just, I've always said this and I've done this with adults who were very aggressive. When I got into the program for some adults, they were like in time out in the quiet room, you know, 10 times a day, banging their heads through windows and whatever else. And all I came in and said was, this is just unfair. It's just an unfair environment. Make it fair. Make it fair. Put yourself in his shoes and make it fair. 
Another thing I was going to say for this individual is, you know, we all have bad days. Like, what do you do? I remember when my kids were little and they would ha <clears throat> I would take them to the pediatrician. I always considered that, like, you know, a stressful event for them. <laughs> so, <laughs> although it wasn't, I mean, really, but still, what, what I, I always tried to make it a positive thing. So right after the pediatrician, we'd go to the store downstairs and buy something, right? Or, like, if I traveled, I'd always get them gifts from the 99-cent store when I was gone. Like, on days when it's tough, just add reinforcers. That's all. Yeah. So if he's going to have a tough day, if you know he didn't sleep the previous night, if you know his teacher is not in that day, if you know he's sick, if you know whatever, he's had a bad morning, just increase the reinforcers. You can either increase the amount or increase them in frequency. And something that I, I heard you say recently that really struck home with me, too, is that part of the way we are able to do all this is making sure that we reinforce ourselves. Oh, yeah. That when they're having a bad day, chances are we're already having a bad day. Or if we weren't, we're going to have a bad day Absolutely now, too. Absolutely right. So we find things that are reinforcing to them, and we find things that are reinforcing to us as well. Definitely. That, and it might be the same thing, or it could be something different. But reminding yourself, okay, if you're going to go through this intervention where you're going to make it so that he doesn't need to cry anymore right. to get out right and it's gonna t and you're gonna look at it and say this is gonna take me probably three months end to end to get completely done and then this won't be there anymore but it's gonna be very intensive at the beginning how am I gonna reward myself right and for, I think for doing this truly and I think it's so helpful to have someone guide you through this it's oh, sort of like going invaluable. on a diet yeah I mean if you have someone who can tell you on a daily basis do this workout eat that food I mean it's oh, the same thing right yeah. I mean you might even know it but it's so much better if someone tells you which we should really provide that service you know just people to call in and ask for guidance but what I'm saying is yes you know here's the problem Shannon most of the time the thing that does actually reward us is seeing our kids happy yeah. right and the problem with that that's a great thing however a lot of times that means we give in Yes. Right? Because our child is sort of like tantruming and we hate to see the tantrum. Yeah. Instead of thinking, I'm going to handle this situation for three more months and when it's over, it's just going to be over and it's all going to be great. Yeah. We give in and, you know, we have short term reward because the child's happy, but then the behavior goes on forever. And of course, my visual brain goes to when we give in, it's like we're signing a contract saying, yes, I would like for this to continue. <laughs> yes. You know, that that's what we're doing in that moment. Absolutely. Yeah. I want to sign right. up for three more that's years totally of this true. hell. Um, you know, and that isn't what we mean to be doing. Um, Not that at is all. what right. we do. Right. Uh, really great, great advice. We've got more questions pouring in. We're going to take a short break and come back more with Ask Dr. Doreen. Stick with us. Welcome back to Let's Talk Autism. Uh, actually, this is Autism Live. We're going to do Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy a little bit later. I'm confused. I don't know which bus I'm on. That's okay. Um, but in any case, we're here right now for Ask Dr. Doreen with Dr. Doreen Grandpache, and she is answering your questions. She is a true expert and visionary in the field of autism. She has multiple decades decades of experience working with individuals who are on the autism spectrum and helping them to achieve their highest potential. Uh, she's a wonderful resource. You guys are writing in questions. We're answering them as fast as we can. I, I love this one. Somebody wrote this in during the night. My teen forgets to turn in homework and classwork. How can we promote this executive functioning skill? How much <laughs> do I love you that you guys are? It's all coming together, right? We're learning these terms oh, yeah, and understanding where the holes are in our children and that's yeah. empowering yeah so maybe I'll start by uh, telling this parent that so does mine <laughs> <laughs> all right. And I, that's I struggle with the same thing. And that's a little reassuring, isn't it, for all of us to realize, okay, it isn't just kids on the spectrum. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. This is a sure. tough subject. Yeah, but that doesn't mean, issue, yeah. doesn't mean that we can't work on it. No. And it's, a, it's valuable in that these are the years where generally our kids are learning these things, hopefully. Right? I mean, it's not like we all were not able to handle as much as we did we do now when we were younger yeah so planning is something you learn over time um i would you just need to it's a matter of turning in homework we actually have a really good uh system but i mean 
So make sure he gets a, he or she gets a journal of some type. I mean, you, schools still have journals. Yeah. And um, that he writes in the homework on the day that it's given, but also on the day that it's due. Um, and then every night he just has to look at tomorrow's stuff and that'll remind him. So it's just a matter of where you write it in. And if he's not able to write things in, then it's a very easy system too. You could color code the classes, you know, put a, a pink sticker on every day where there's French homework due or whatever it is, you know. So, but it's a matter of using the journal appropriately. We actually have a really good planning, um, what is it called? I think it's school planning program in skills in the mm -hmm. academic section. It's really good. And we have a lot of planning activities and worksheets yes. in the executive functioning section of skills as well. Um, in fact, we started to develop the executive functioning section of skills just because of things like this, yeah. because our kids were all getting to the middle age, middle school age, and they were like, couldn't plan things, especially because once they hit teenage years, they're like given homework, but it's not due tomorrow. It's due in a week or it's three days or whatever oh, yeah. it is. That's what's hard. That's the parent stomach ache, right? Because you it's don't true. know about it until the night before right, right. when all of a sudden it's due now and you have to be up at the store buying the trifold uh, cardboard thing <laughs> and it becomes your problem, right? Oh my God. How yeah. many times have I like stayed up all night helping my kids finish a book? Or yeah, you know, like... glue and popsicle sticks together to make the fort to represent what the whatever diorama, right? Um, it's a problem, and yeah. but there are lots of different ways around it. And I will say this: that um, as a as a former teacher, when I read through the executive functions curriculum for the first time, I, the, what I said out loud was, "Oh my goodness." Every seventh grader should have to go through this. Mm -hmm. Every seventh grader. I'm not talking about just kids on the autism spectrum. And and by the way, if, if they're older than that and they haven't had the opportunity to do it in seventh grade, it, it's great for I. To do it. I learned from it. Um, but if every seventh grader went through it, we would have higher test scores. Yeah. We would have kids that are more productive, and we would have teachers that were happier. It's true. Because it's in seventh grade, starting at that point, it's really difficult difficult to get them to be able to, you know, do this on their own. But there's right. a great curriculum available to you in right. skills. Right. Uh, really, really remarkable. Yeah. But, it's, it's work. It's work, but it's just teaching them to organize themselves. And what about reinforcing when they do do it? Absolutely. I mean, you always want to, uh, once you get the child to actually turn things in. I mean, I made a deal with my son, I think, uh, recently, where I said, uh, I'm going to check every night and if there's anything because on the, on the in their school system it's wonderful because they have blackboard and it shows if homework's been turned in or it's missing. Oh, love that. So then if they if it's missing, I said you need to pay me a dollar. And if if you turn it in and you felt get full um, credit, I'll give you $5. Ooh. So there's a much bigger motivation for him to actually turn things in and get full credit. Wonderful. So we'll see if yeah. it works. We'll, we'll check back with you. <laughs> but a lot of that. it, I mean, honestly, and I'm thankful to this parent for bringing this up because I really think a lot of it has to do with not just the consequences, but actually taking the time. Like, you know, for my son, I think it would be just helpful for him to follow the same steps, which is, you know, go to Blackboard every single day, open this thing. And, you know, here's another problem. A lot of times our kids even forget the books to bring home. Yes. So that those are things. That's why my oldest daughter had taught my other kids at one point how to write in their journals at the bottom, like as they receive homework, just note on the bottom of the of that page like what you need to bring home, uh -huh. so that at night you can immediately see all the books you have to bring, or in the after, you know after school. So those are important things that can be very helpful. I believe I'm, I'm, they they're writing in somebody saying same child, but I've got several people writing in. Uh, he is performing poorly academically due to his lack of attention. The school believes he should be in a social, functional setting, focusing on life skills. He's verbal but very prompt, dependent, and easily uh, loses focus during academic time. I'm considering taking him out of school, but I'm worried about socialization and academics. I'm planning to take him to a playground, so this isn't the same child, seven-year-old, uh, a few days a week and set up play dates. Any suggestions or thoughts uh, that uh, for children that started 
an ABA intensive program at a later time, in this case, seven years old. So seven-year-old starting an ABA program, performing poorly in academics, uh, school thinks that he should be in a social, functional setting, focusing on life skills. I have no idea what that means, by the way. Uh, if you, I mean, I would recommend a lot of different life skills, but I would not pull him out of regular ed. From what I, he, from what you're telling me, he seems like a very high-functioning child, and he, you, sh he should have one-to-one -one aid in school, and he should have an ABA program. And the fact that he's starting at seven means nothing to me other than he's very high-functioning. So he's actually got a very good chance to come out of it completely if he gets the right intervention. That's the type of child where I would recommend that you, if he's in school at seven, I would assume he's in school for 30 hours a week. And I would suggest that he has a one-to-one -one aid at least 20 of those hours. And if possible, you, can, you should actually reduce the school time to 20 hours and therefore give him also 20 hours at home. And what you're focusing on then is all the social stuff, executive functioning stuff you should get on skills. And, even if, and you definitely need an, an ABA provider because this is a lot of hours and you'll need a therapists and they'll ha they should follow the, the skills curriculum and they should um, be using areas such as the cognitive, executive functioning, social and probably language uh, curriculum areas. And if he needs other areas as well, of course, academics and uh, adaptive skills and play and so on, but particularly the executive functioning stuff. And I, I'm not sure in terms of when you talk about the, the social functional versus the life and the life skills, but a lot of schools have uh, a moment in time in which they decide, well, we're not going to stress as much about the academics. Sometimes that happens when a student is 16, mm -hmm. um, but this child is seven and and, and and she's saying, I'm concerned about socialization and academics. I love what you've said because I think sometimes it appears that schools give up yeah, on a child exactly, getting exactly. to that's, academic standards. Absolutely. And that's kind of why I became all defensive. For this yeah. child, that's yeah. how I get. It's kind of like, oh my God, he's high functioning and verbal and... What are yeah. we, we're reducing demands? No, we should be increasing. Yeah. And so this is when you really do want to give him a higher level of um, attention. Yeah. Like one-to-one -one tutoring, um, which is what you get through ABA. Yeah. And don't back off by any means. Push him and get a one-to-one -one person for him, and and it'll all work out. It's really important when it appears like when it even looks like someone on your child's team it's is going to give up on your child. It's time to replace them with somebody else. So true. Don't join it's them. So that's such an important thing, and don't listen to them. Yeah. You know, sometimes. Yeah. Like people really, and, and that whole concept, this is why our education system is going down the drain. Because yeah. if it becomes hard for a teacher to teach a child, they just give up. Yeah. Because, you know, I could just modify the IEP and it yeah. doesn't really matter. Well, what is he going to do for his future? Yeah. The story that I always tell is that my son's very first IEP, when, I, when we were talking about what was going to happen and they wanted to put him in the lowest functioning room, in a room with kids who had helmets on and were hitting their heads against the wall and being allowed to. Yeah. And I said, we're not going to do that, right? And uh, at one point, they got a little frustrated with me and said, what is it you want? Mm -hmm. He was three. And I said, I want an in-home ABA program. I want to do 40 hours a week because I've seen that that's what works. And then eventually, I want him to go to an included preschool and go to a kindergarten. And the one person who was supposed to be the autism expert said, Wah. and I said, when he goes to kindergarten, I want him to be caught up and, and be able to be academically with uh, neurotypical peers. When he, and she looked at me and she said, well, that's going to be really hard. <laughs> right? He was three. And this is what she said to me. And it was one of those clarifying moments for me as an autism parent. It felt like a marble that dropped where it was like, make a decision right here, right now. And I said, and my finger went up and I said, I'm an autism mom. It was the first time I ever claimed that out loud. I said, do not talk to me about what is hard. I know all about hard. Talk to me about what's possible. Ugh. That's all I want to hear is what's possible. That's just and, amazing. And, you know, and it was that moment where I went, this is how we're going to do things. And I'm not going to deal with people like that. And she was not allowed to be on the team. That's I was very clear about that. That's going to be hard. Really? You say that to a parent of a three-year-old? Ugh, I'm still mad about it. It's like 
it makes 10 years me, later and I'm at. Me, it just upsets <laughs> me so much, you know? Yeah. Well, and, uh, and remember I'm, that all of those things came to pass. He did an intensive ABA program at home, 40 hours. Then he went to the neurotypical included preschool and when his first day of kindergarten he was on he was Target. completely caught up with neurotypical peers and included right, right. um and, and was it what? hard yes yeah. was it possible yes yeah. and that's the thing it's like well you know thank god in in his case in jem's case this is what 10 years ago or something was, so eight years ago eight years ago right so you know when you look at some of our older families like you know bonnie and so on and so forth those yeah. guys in those days, Ugh. nobody would say, oh, that's going to be very hard. Those days, they would actually say, that's impossible. Yeah. You're out of your mind. Yeah. Go put him in an institution. Go put him in special ed and save your money for the rest of it. He's going to need it. Yes. That's the kind of stuff they used oh, yeah. to say. So, hey, you know what? We've made progress. At least now educators say it's going to be hard. <laughs> There we it's go. not impossible. And hopefully they say more than that. And this kind of goes hand in hand. We've got a question. The person says, this is uh, for the psychologist doctor. Um, I, they said, to tell you an awesome hello, I am studying about children who have autism. My biggest worry is about talking to the parents about their child. Mm. I know some of the therapists and teachers talk out of their bottom without any knowledge about what they're talking about. And I don't want to be that therapist mm. uh, because I had that myself. How do I do that? this all of the time. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you for everything for the show. I have been watching around two years. Mm. Uh, P.S. Drivers and bus aides are the most amazing uh, people, uh, and everyone forgets about them all the time. So a shout out to some of the good drivers and bus aides. So how do we talk to you are like the queen of this. You you empower parents. You you have a way of making us feel like you get it. Yeah. And I think it's first of all, you know, welcome and I'm so glad to have someone who's becoming a uh, professional clinician and caring about this. That's mm -hmm. wonderful. You know, I I, I think I, I don't know, I'm trying to figure out when I, you know, I think I know for sure that I connected to parents before I connected to children. There's no question in my mind. I mean, I remember the young, the earliest parents that I had when I was back at UCLA. Um, and I still have connection to some of them, actually. And I remember, um, I guess, worrying about them more than about the kids, mm -hmm. because for some reason, I just worried about that. And I think it, it, this is all really about empathy. And, you know, we as, as psychologists, they teach you a lot about transference and counter-transference and how you have to be very sort of careful about uh, having too much emotion towards your patient's issues. Because you, if you start to get too personally involved, it uh, can can ruin the, the therapeutic relationship in some ways. And I've never really had a problem with that because, you know, f for me, I instantly uh, put myself in the position of the parent and I really see everything from their perspective. Now, obviously, it was a lot harder when I didn't have kids myself, when you're younger. But still, the empathy was there. I mean, still just imagining how it would feel to have a child who is your hopes and dreams and everything that you ever want and joy and happiness. And then they gradually lose skills or stop talking or they never connect and they're different from the other kids and they're falling behind and you're worrying and worrying and worrying and nobody's telling you what to do and you finally get someone to accept what it is and then they tell you it's hopeless and if you just run through that in your own head you'll begin to understand a one hundredth of what parents actually go through if you spend a two or three days living with a family who has a severely autistic child, you'll begin to understand. I was fortunate in that when I was doing my internships, the institutions still existed. Mm -hmm. So I did a bunch of uh, internships and stuff at Camarillo State Hospital. I was at hospitals where I could see severe autism mm -hmm. um, and I could see what it had done to families. So for me, and, and then on the other hand, I was blessed in that I could see the kids who recovered, right? And we were the, the group at UCLA 
who actually recovered kids for the first time. So I could see both sides of it. And so for me, it was always very possible to just jump in have that level of empathy but then also have hope and try to pull the parents with me to that hope and it didn't really even matter if you know the child didn't recover that wasn't the point the point was uh for the parents to understand and accept and to be able to always push their child and always know that the child would improve and would get better And also it has to do with, you know, how we define, uh, I guess, normal, you know, all of our normal kids also have issues. Everybody has issues. There's a continuum. It's not like er there's anyone who's perfect. So it's kind of like making sure you understand that all of our kids have some issues. It's a learning process. It's a growth process. And then, you know, as you get older, this that's sort of for the psychologist, but then as you get older and you go through some hardships yourself, you become more spiritual and you understand that we get... My perspective now, Shannon, quite honestly, is like I, I don't just really want to help and empathize with the parents. I... I, I um, honor they're they're so much higher in my mind because they've been given such a huge um, I guess gift of learning mm-hmm. you know in my life it's in my view you only get what you're capable of handling yeah and the world of autism, I don't think anybody understands it unless you go through it and if yeah. you were given a child with autism, you're pretty strong in the in the eyes of God, you know, or the universe, because you've been entrusted with uh, making it through this. And making so me weep. Well, no, but that's how I see it. That's how yeah. I see it, and that really helps me get through it because I think, you know, parents of aut- kids with autism often are they they often are. You know, they feel stigmatized, right? I mean, I'm sure you know that because they can't explain. They take their child to a movie theater, a child's freaking out and screaming. They take their child to the supermarket, the child's like throwing objects, whatever. And so they're embarrassed all the time for their child. Whereas in my mind, you you know, we should truly, truly, the world should really honor the families of kids with disabilities because what they're going through is just beyond the comprehension of anyone else. It's just beyond comprehension. And if you as a psychologist have that level of respect for the families, you'll be fine. Yeah. There's nothing that will go wrong because you just respect them and you know, you you know, you empathize and you understand and you just respect, you respect what they're going through. That's the most important thing. Wow. And the world will be a better place with more psychologists and more therapists who Absolutely. think like you do. Oh, well, thank you. Thank uh, you. Truly. We should take a short break. I need to mop down and we'll be right <laughs> back with more questions. Stick with us. Welcome back to Ask Dr. Doreen. We are here with Dr. Doreen Grampache, a true expert in the field of autism, and she is answering your questions. We had another question come in on the live mm-hmm. feature. Love the show. Can you please give me some ideas on ways I can increase social interactions, comments, and requests with a seven-year-old with autism. He has lots of words, but little to no spontaneous language and needs to be prompted to say hello or request an item. I would love it if he could say, can we go outside and play? Thank you so much. That's awesome. Can we go outside and play is really easy to teach, but there's a lot of other stuff you want to teach him as well. So, um, Social language essentially does start with what we call manding, and manding is just requests. And so a request could be, you know, I want juice, or it could be, I want to go outside. So, um, and I don't know the level of his language, and you'd want to expand the, the just the sentence length and the, the use of descriptors and so on. But regardless, the easiest thing you can do is, you know, stand by the door, and uh, if he can read, maybe have the words. I'd like to go outside and play. If he can't read, you will model it for him and just say, I want to go outside. And he will repeat you and every time he does, you open the door and take him outside and play. So that's the very most basic, basic verbal instruction that we do is manding. Um, Having said that, a child who is at this level where you want to teach him social uh, language, please, please, Go on skills. This you are the type of family that will really, really, really benefit because there's 
there's no way I would be doing you justice just answering that question. There are so many language things you would have to teach him in a specific order. Um, in order for him, that's not, if he, if there's a child that says, I'd like to go outside and play, or we can teach him that, trust me, you can teach him to have conversations with peers, join groups, do all sorts of descriptive language and social language. So it's really important for you to do it and teach things in the right order. Um, so that the complexity is very minimal in the beginning and then gradually develops and also language and social and sort of some cognitive abilities have to play hand in hand in order for the child to grow and improve. So please uh, get on skills and do the index, the questionnaire, the assessment and you'll see all the different basic things you have to teach your child before they can get to this level and how to build to that level. And it, it will save you a lifetime of work. Oh, totally. It it's is, just it is a lifetime of work compiled that you don't have to go and take the eight college classes and have the precursor degree in something yeah. to understand. Yeah. It's all there for you. Cut right, and dry. Right. Teach this, then teach this, and then teach this. Amazing. Yeah. So what is it? Skillsforautism.com. Yes. Yeah, Skillsforautism.com. There's a 14-day free trial. Uh, I use it at home. It's amazing. Uh, truly amazing. And while you're there, it has all the executive functions things that we were talking about earlier yep. as well but there's one whole curriculum that's just for language that is crazy good let's say that crazy and, good. and my favorite curriculum is the social which is the largest curriculum it, there's I, I, it would be like picking a favorite child I don't know which one I would pick <laughs> to, as my favorite but I do love the executive functions yeah uh, so I don't know but I wouldn't say I, I, I couldn't pick a favorite <laughs> okay another person who says hi dr. Doreen my mother met you when you did your presentation in Fort Myers Florida she was the first one there and took a picture of you and her together hopefully she didn't oh, yeah, ask you too many questions but I just wanted to say thank you for all you do I am a skills user there you go awesome. and have so much hope for my five-year-old and thanks again oh that's awesome thank you you made my day that's, <laughs> that's the kind of thing I live for thank there we you very go much. and I do remember your mom absolutely and and I don't think you could ask too many questions ever I don't think that's possible uh, here's a great question uh, what do we have to do to change our parenting style to better help a recently diagnosed Asperger teen mm. Uh, so I'll have to answer that pretty generally because we have like just a couple of minutes left and that's pretty broad. Um, Asperger's individuals tend to be very black and white. So anything that is kind of in the unclear rules uh, bothers them. So in other words, words like try to avoid using things that are unclear, like, you know, um, later. Um, somewhat, you know, those types of words. So every, you know, there are some people in, in the world, um, if you look at like my two daughters, one of them is very rule governed and the other one is extremely um, non-rule governed. A free governed, spirit. Free spirit. <laughs> yeah, you know them, right? So, um, and if someone is rule governed, the world seems like a much safer and, uh, you know, they make sense of the world much more if everything is a rule. So that means if you want to help your child with Asperger's, just be able to comprehend things. It's kind of like give them a routine. That'll help. Don't put them in a position where they need to make a lot of decisions. That becomes very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, give them visual flow charts, I suppose. You know, flow charts that are like, if yes, then do this. Mm -hmm. If no, do that. A decision tree. Decision tree. That's yeah. what I was looking for. Decision tree. Help your child actually learn how to make a decision tree. And so that, that situations that happen, they can draw a decision tree for themselves and think of all the options and that'll help them solve problems. But just, I think that's the best like general advice is that people with Asperger's tend to want rules. They don't like it when you leave too many options. Okay, really, really remarkable.